Hi guys, welcome to your online lecture for the functional anatomy of the thorax and abdominal cavity. As mentioned in the previous online lectures, the goal of this lecture is really to review the anatomy so that we spend less time um, reviewing anatomy in class and we spend more time on really diving deep into the pathologies, injuries, and illnesses that may plague the thorax and abdominal cavity. We'll first talk about the thorax and then we'll move into the abdomen um, at the end of this particular lecture. But this, what you see on this screen, is considered to be the thorax. We know about the thorax is it's commonly known as uh, the chest or called the chest, but you guys are sports medicine practitioners or you will be. So we really should call it the thorax because that's truly is its anatomical name. The thorax itself lies between the neck, um, so the base of the neck, and then the diaphragm, which isn't pictured here, but would, would lie there, yes. Uh, and so then what we know about the thorax is that it is comprised of 12 pairs of ribs, and those ribs kind of give it, give it its shape, um, and then it doesn't extend past the uh, thoracic spine. Uh, the thoracic spine, for those of you that need a review, I'll call it T-spine from here on out, but the thoracic spine contains 12 vertebrae, uh, and so what we're saying is that the thorax does not extend past the thoracic spine when we're looking at the spinal column in, in general. So as we move forward, really, um, as I said, the ribs give, give the thorax its shape. They are these flat bones that are attached posteriorly through to the thoracic spine, uh, but then anteriorly they're attached to the, the, the sternum some way, some shape, some form. Uh, as we look at the ribs uh, in depth, what we know is that, again, as I've said, there are um, 12 sets of ribs. So ribs one um, through seven are called our, our true ribs. And the reason they're called the true ribs um, is because each of these ribs in particular are joined anteriorly to the sternum by a separate, let me say that again, by a separate costal cartilage. So you can kind of see here, rib one is joined to the sternum by its own cartilage. Rib two is the same, three, so forth and so on. When we get to ribs eight, nine, and 10, we call these ribs the, the, the false ribs. And the reason we call them the false ribs is for the same reason we, we don't call the true ribs false ribs. It's because each of these ribs are conjoined, um, are attached to the sternum via the same cartilage. So these ribs do not have independent costal cartilage attachments to the sternum. So they're called false ribs for that reason. But keep in mind, these ribs, as we move posteriorly, will have their independent attachment to the thoracic spine. The last two ribs are called the floating ribs, and those are ribs 11 and 12. Uh, and they're called floating ribs because they have no attachment to the anterior portion of the sternum. But again, they do have a posterior attachment to the thoracic spine. So there are three groups of ribs, but 12 total ribs overall. What we would say about the thoracic or the th the thoracic cavity or the thorax um, anteriorly is that its major role and function in the body is to protect our vital organs, and particularly to protect our respiratory and circulatory organs. Um, when we're thinking respiratory. What we're really thinking about is they're protecting the lungs, right? And then if we were thinking um, circulatory, what we would be thinking about is that it's protecting our, our heart, right? In other words, those ribs are going to be the first point of contact or impact. Um, so if we were to take a kick to the thorax, if we were to take a blow to the thorax, if we were to get in a car accident and our thorax hits the steering wheel, the first point of impact, it's going to be our ribs and our sternum, right? Anteriorly, at least. And so that is, I think, God's way of kind of protecting those important organs that need protecting, right? Those ribs kind of kind of create the shape, as I stated, um, and surround our heart and our lungs, and even distally our liver and our, and our spleen. Um, and so when blows occur to these areas, we can rest assured that most often, unless you know, we encounter an older woman who's osteoporotic, is that the ribs will bear the impact. And it's why we don't see as many vital organ injuries on the anterior aspect um, of, of the thorax it, itself. 
So that is the thorax uh, anatomy in in general. We'll uh, we'll talk about pathologies and injuries that plague the actual thorax. Uh, As you will see, we've only talked about the bony anatomy. So I I think it's important that we also talk about the muscular anatomy um, of, of the thorax. So here's the thing. The muscular anatomy gets so much credit in the thorax, right? A lot of times we're also consumed with, oh, that that 12 pack that people um, aspire to get, right? Or if we're in the gym and we're working out, we're, we're worried about those huge pecs um, and or delts or biceps, right? And so the thorax cavity really gets all of this credit for the way that it looks. But just think, you guys, if we're really thinking about the slide that we just bypassed, the major functional structure of the thorax is really provided by um, the bony anatomy, yes? And then what we could say is that as we're looking at the the muscular system of the thorax, that it does play a major role, right? It definitely does. Does it play a major role in protecting the uh, vital organs? Not necessarily. But when we look at our muscles and we talk about um, core stability, right? You guys have all heard of that um, and low back pain. Then we definitely want to give the muscles of the thorax um, they're, they're due. We know about the muscles um, of, of the thorax uh, is that when they contract, we're allowed to kind of sit in this erect posture um, or this upright posture. So they play a major role in uh, postural stability as well. Uh, but most of the functional anatomy regarding protecting internal organs or vital organs truly is driven through the bony anatomy. And I would say, I wouldn't go as far as saying like the muscular anatomy is just known for for, for its looks, um, it's a lot more than that, right? And so what we know about the the, the pecs and, and the delts is that they play a major role in providing stability to, to the shoulder uh, in some ways because the pecs actually have direct attachment to that sternum. They play a major role in kind of move, sternal movement. And then as we move further down um, and we look at the, I guess you could just group all of these into one and call them the abdominal muscles. Uh, I think they play major roles in in breathing. So injury to them could also cause um, issues with breathing in our patient population. Injuries to the abdominal muscles could also inhibit a patient's ability to flex the spine or extend the spine the spine even rotate. In some cases, injuries injuries to abdominal muscles have been linked to um, inability to breathe efficiently and effectively. So the muscular um, system of the thorax does play a major role in providing stability, in creating that core uh, stabilization. Uh, It does also help to protect the vital organs, but again, it's mainly the bony anatomy that is going to do that. So as we move forward, uh, I think what we're going to talk about next is the abdominal cavity. The abdominal cavity lies between, the, okay, so we talked about this already, the, kind of the, the diaphragm um, and, and, and the pelvic bone. So it's this structure here that we're most um, concerned about or we're most interested in when we're talking about the abdominal cavity itself. Um, What is interesting about the abdominal cavity and the reason that we kind of talk about the muscles first um, is that the abdominal muscles um, and the vertebral column are kind of what create the boundaries for for the abdominal cavity, if if that makes sense. Right. So over here you have your abdominal muscles kind of creating that that boundary here. Um, And so. With that said, the abdominal muscles, so the rectus abdominis, the external internal obliques, right? They're all important in terms of um, protecting the uh, abdominal viscera um, or some of the internal organs as well. So you can kind of see those internal internal organs there. Um, So with the abdominal cavity, um, we're really going to focus on in this particular class is really knowing where um, some of the most important anatomical structures lie. Um, so there are two different ways that the abdominal cavity is broken up. The first way is is into the nine gastric re- regions, and then the second way would be into the four different quadrants. Most often um, in, in a lower division class, we typically learn about the four quadrants, but I think it's important to talk about the nine gastric regions as well. So when we're looking um, at the right hypochondriac region, the epigastric region, or the left hypochondriac region, 
um, lumbar region, iliac region, these, they get their names based on their, their location, right? So an example of that would be, um, this is close to the pelvis or the ilium of the pelvis, which is why it gets its name iliac region. Um, this is close to the lumbar spine, which is why it gets the right lumbar region. And then this is closest to the stomach. And so it gets epigastric region. Uh, so as we, we begin to look at these different um, sections of the abdominal cavity, I think what's most important is kind of looking at it from a four quadrant approach. In the right upper quadrant, um, what we have is, and is beautifully drawn in here, is the liver. Uh, in the left upper quadrant, which isn't drawn in here, we have the spleen. So it's spleen here. Uh, and then what we have in the lower um, left quadrant is what you see here, um, the intestines. But in some cases, it's the descending colon. And then uh, what's most important in the right lower quadrant is going to be the appendix, right? Um, scary enough, it is between the ages of about 16 to 19 that we see most appendicitis occur so um, and if they if they do occur we're looking at this right lower quadrant um, as the answer yes so we've got liver in the right upper quadrant um, we've got uh, spleen in the left upper quadrant we've got the appendix in the right lower quadrant and essentially we have the descending colon in the left lower quadrant one of the concerns about um, kind of abdominal injuries and blows to the abdominal cavity is this concept of, of referred pain. Um, and this is going to be important when we lecture. Um, so it's, it's good to know the definition. So when we think about referred pain, what we're essentially saying is that it's pain that is felt in one area of the body that does not accurately represent where the problem actually is, right? So you, your patient comes in, they com they're complaining of pain, but that pain is not in the area of injury. So is not in the area of injury. I hope that makes sense. If not, let me give you an example. Um, so example would be if a patient has a liver injury, right? So they take a blow to the liver, they're bleeding from the liver. That patient most often is going to complain of pain in the right shoulder, right? So that's kind of scary, but that's referred pain. It's this idea that there are all of these nerves that kind of innervate the abdominal cavity organs. And so, and those nerves obviously travel up to the cervical spine. So the concern with referred pain is that your patient may come in complaining of right shoulder pain and you'll do a full on um, evaluation of the right shoulder and you'll send them home and then they'll bleed internally, right? That isn't to say everybody that reports to you in your clinic, right, who has right shoulder pain, you should check the liver, but you should be able to, through history questions, figure out if the liver is actually involved. So again, refer referred pain is pain that is felt in one area of the body that does not accurately represent where the, the problem actually is. So why do I say this? Because we don't want to get tunnel vision um, when we evaluate the abdominal cavity. We have to be, we have to have, I guess, wide, wide vision, right? Um, so much so that it would allow us to not miss something that's hugely um, important. So last not least, I just kind of wanted to give you a, a different image um, of the abdominal cavity. So as we're looking here, kind of drew in the liver. But again, this is going to be right, right upper quadrant right? And this is going to be left upper quadrant. And this is going to be right lower quadrant. And this is going to be left lower quadrant, right? And so as you, as I mentioned, the liver is going to be in the upper right, but does it kind of go over into the, the um, upper left quadrant? Absolutely. And then um, the spleen, it's drawn in here beautifully. So here, right? That's going to be in the upper left quadrant. And then what I don't see is the appendix, but you could kind of draw it kind of in here it'd be in the right lower quadrant and then just as a review um pretty much the descending colon is going to be drawn in right here so i hope this has been helpful um, i hope that as we move into the thorax lecture that we're able to have a more in-depth conversation please bring questions as you might have them looking forward to seeing you guys in class